uh, we've just been having a conversation about worship, and in a little bit, we're going to go back into worship to practice what it is we're talking about today. So I found, I, I, I've been really wrestling with how do I present today's conversation, and I went online and started doing research about peers and the type of influence. How many have ever ha- heard the phrase, they've had peer pressure? Is peer pressure a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it a healthy thing? Is it an unhealthy thing? And I found this study that, uh, that was done. Actually, it was done because of a gentleman by the name of Solomon Ash. They took seven kids and put them in a room. They put these seven kids in the room and told all seven kids to give the wrong answer. But then they put an eighth person in the room and to just see what this eighth person would do. So what they did is they held up two charts. And this line has three lines of various sizes. And then this one clearly matches one of those lines. So if I were to say A, B, or C, which one does this line is the same size? A, B, or C? A, B, or C? Everybody says A, or everyone said C, correct? So something that was interesting, as the kids sat in the room, in the first study, all seven of the, the, if we can say this, the traders... They all said it was B, clearly not the same same size. And by the time it came to that eighth kid that didn't know what was going on, did you think they said C or do you think that they went with B? Two-thirds of the percent of the people that did this study went with the group, even though it was... B is clearly longer than C, right? Or, or this side one. Two-thirds of people went along with it. And you would say, well, that was kids. Actually, they did the study over different ages, different races, and different sex, uh, sexualities, males and females. And they found the same to be true. When the group collectively would even give the wrong answer, two-thirds of everyone went along with the group. It's the power of peer influence. Now, they did something else with the test. They then brought in the seven kids, and six of the kids would answer the wrong answer being B. But the final kid before the subject that didn't know what was going on would give the correct answer. They would say something like this. As I look at it, I may be looking at it different than everybody else, but I'm pretty sure C is the correct answer. And then 95 plus percent of the time, the other person went ahead and had the boldness to give the correct answer of C. It's amazing when one person speaks out truth, how it can change everything around them. So let's talk about your personal worship. When you're sitting in a group, do you go with the group or are you willing to stand out? When God is pressing on you, I would like you to kneel down, but no one else is kneeling down. I want you to raise your hand, but I don't know if this is what they do around here. I want you to clap to keep ahead of it. Ready for this? I want you to sing loud enough where the person next to you might be able to hear you. I know, right? Why do you think we have the music so loud? To help drown out your voice. And so we want you to have that expression. But what happens When you feel God calling you to do something, but it's not what everybody else is voting for, will you be the one? And so I say we look at David's life now to find out more about this. I'm actually going to read to you out of Psalms chapter, uh, if I could have a little bit of help on my front screen here, uh, I want to read to you uh, out of Psalms 95. And it's a Psalms that David wrote, and as he was writing it, let me... uh, So I'm actually going to read it off this. And when I said 95, I meant 57. Yeah, we're going to change it up on you totally here. Psalms 57 verse 1 says this, Have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. Has anyone ever said a prayer like this before? You feel like life is crumbling down, you need Jesus' help, and the only thing you are able to say to him is help. I need you. What do I do? So I'm going to take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Because no matter what David was trying to do, no matter what he was trying to create, no matter what he was trying to solve, he just knew he needed to stay under the shadow of the Almighty to rest for another season. I'm going to cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. See, he sends from heaven and saves me rebuking those who hotly pursue me. I don't know if you've ever been hotly pursued before, but I'm pretty sure that means you're going as fast as you can because the people looking to destroy you are going as fast as they can. 
And by the way, nowadays, this probably doesn't mean grabbing up an army, chasing you into the desert. This could be posts that you see on social media. This could be gossip around the water cooler. This could be gossip around the water cooler. I'm pretty sure I just dated myself with that example right there. Right? This could be that group text that you were once a part of that you're no longer a part of. Any of these type of things, you ever feel like you were being hotly pursued, but God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. See, I'm in the midst of lions. This is David writing what he's feeling. I am forced to dwell among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp as sword. So not only are they looking to physically harm him, but they are looking to destroy the reputation in which he is built up. Be exalted, O God. With all that happening on, going, David says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let them spread a net for my feet. I was bowed down in distress. They dug a pit in my path, but they have failed into into it. They have fallen into it themselves. My heart, O God, is steadfast. 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 When you read that, those two words right there, my heart, O God, is steadfast, that is a recurring statement. This wasn't a, 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 I received news about cancer and I said, oh God, heal me and moved on. No, if I got news about cancer, I guarantee my prayers would sound something more like this. Oh God, I need your healing in my body. Oh God, I need your healing in my body. Oh God, I need your healing in my body. One of my kids walks away from God. Do you think I'm saying one prayer? And saying, Lord, bring them back to you. Do you think I'm going to say, bring my prodigal son, daughter home? Bring my prodigal son. No, it's going to be this continual thing. David is in the middle of this battle right now, in this middle of this warfare, where he has to say this, I'm going to stay steadfast in God. Because many times in our life, we want to run and try to handle things ourselves. But what about those times where we just need to stay steadfast in our God? See, it's, it, this is kind of a beautiful Psalms if you just kind of read this and look at it. But if you know what's actually happening in David's life right now, it may mean a little bit more to you. So the text is only as good as the context. So let's do this. Let's look at 1 Samuel 24. I'm just going to tell you the story. David right now has been anointed king of Israel. David has slew David, or Goliath and has now become national hero to all of Israel. While David is this national hero, Saul realizes that he is becoming less loved by the community. Actually, we know this because of a song that was written. Saul has killed his 1,000, David his 10,000. And so Saul wasn't even topping out on the pop charts anymore. David got all the fame. David got all the glory. Saul became famous. Just so you know, one person got that joke, and I felt like it deserved a little bit more than that. But, and so David, because of Saul's jealousy, even though he was anointed to be king and had the respect of everybody, David had to run and flee. And David's now running through the desert, fleeing for his life. Saul finds out where he is, grabs thousands of guys to go with him to kill David. David has to, with this band of men that he has, Climb deep into a cave and hide. So you remember the scripture that it just said, that uh, David just said, that I'm going to hide in the shadow. I'm going to find refuge. The reason David is saying this, because he is physically in a cave, hidden behind a rock, as this massive army is going out front. And if they would find out he was in there, there's no escape at all. Death is imminent. And so David's hiding in this rock, and then something crazy happens. And by the way, you can read this for yourself. It's absolutely true. And I'm not trying to be crude. I'm just trying to report. Saul had to go to the bathroom. That's the story. And if you say, well, the Bible's not real. Real people don't put stuff like this. (laughs) Like, this is as real as it gets. So Saul goes in the bathroom, and if you read commentary about it, One of the things that commentaries have said is there's most likely that Saul had some type of bowel issue, which made using the restroom uh, extremely difficult. I think this is as clean as I can make it. This is good so far. I'm getting nervous because, you know, mom's sitting over here and you can't make poop jokes in front of mom. And so, (laughs) so Saul is now in a cave uh, trying to go poop. I mean, that's what he's trying to do. And the rest of the army's away, and David now, and read the story for yourself, he's sitting there, Paul's, Saul's sitting there, and I'm thinking every one of David's men have said to him, now's the time to get him. He's defenseless. 
If you strike him down as king, you can immediately take your kingship. So David's in an odd spot because when is it that the battle is ours and when is it the battle's the Lord's? Because I just told God I'm steadfast, but yet I could solve the problem here. But sometimes solving issues in our own strength cause other problems that we can't control. But David does do this. He kind of crawls over, cuts off the hem of his robe, and hides back. Saul finishes, leaves the cave, and as Saul re-engages with his army, Dave come, David comes standing out at the foot of the mouth of the cave, holding up his robe, saying that God could have given me you, but you should know. And then David went on actually to declare publicly his faith in God, which is why I think in Psalms 57, it goes on to say this in verse 8, awake my soul, awake you harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. In verse 9, this is the kind of the key verse, I will praise you, Lord, among the nation. I will sing of you among people. Not privately, not by yourself, but when a line is a different line, I'm going to call it out for what it is, and I'm just going to say when everybody else is having the incorrect answer, I'm going to let you know that God is God and he is king. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the people. For great is your love reaching to the heavens and your faithfulness that reaches the sky. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be all over the earth. It's just amazing. Why is it that when we know that it's time to sing out, we hold back? Is it because of peer pressure? But here's something amazing that you need to hear about yourself. The power of your word changes everything. And sometimes, show me the one scripture where Jesus went to heal a sick person and he thought about it and they were healed. It was never, by the way. Jesus would find that sick person, he would open his mouth, and the power of his word is what changed the sickness in it. At the beginning of time, before heaven and earth was even created, God had an idea, and he, it could have said God thought of creation, and it was in place. But he didn't. God does this. God spoke, and creation came into order. Sometimes in our life, we have to speak out. You can't just think about it. Sometimes you have to declare truth. You have to declare worship. You have to open your mouth, and things around you begin to change. And if you don't believe this, why is it uh, uh, things like AA, NA, and all these type of things? things. The reason they encourage people to come together on a consistent basis and talk about your sobriety. There's something about when you put the words out in the air, it does, it either has creative order or it has the power to destroy the thing trying to destroy you. Because light is the best disinfectant that we can have. So we have to speak out. So why is it that we don't? Science tells us that when we read out loud, we actually comprehend better. You learn better when you speak out loud. You have more power when you speak out loud. There's greater understanding than when you speak out loud. But why is it so many of us, and when it comes time to worship, we say this is for me personally. Well, if it's for you personally, start doing it publicly. Because the power of one person brings about powerful change. And, and I actually was thinking about this. Maybe sometimes we don't like to make our Christian life public because accountability is the greatest catalyst for change. Accountability is the greatest catalyst for change. Here's an example. If I were to get up here and say, hey, in three months, I'm going to be down 25 pounds. <laughs> I mean, I'll never say it, but I, if I got up and said that, here's what I just said. I'm making myself accountable to you. And in three months from now, if I'm not down 25 pounds, you can come up and go, hey, fatty, what happened to the diet? Right? There's something that happens when you make yourself accountable. And when you say things in public, like I'm going to be a worshiper of God, it makes you now accountable that when something happens to you, other people expect you to be a worshiper of God. But you go, well, that's a lot of pressure. It is a lot of pressure because I think we get judged unfairly. Now, this may be David stepping off into his soapbox, but I'm just going to share this with you anyway because the amount of times I hear stories, and yours may vary. It may sound something different. But you have someone who says, listen, 
I go to church, and let's just say this. I'm a wife. I go to church, and my husband does, and I'm a husband. My wife doesn't come to church. And the other day when I was yelling at my kids, they made sure to point out to me that, wow, you're a real good Christian yelling at your kids like that. How many have ever had someone attack your Christianity because of a natural reaction that you have? And by the way, it's true for everybody because we're all practicing Christians. But it's actually proof that they're holding you accountable. But the funny thing is, people hold Christians accountable much different than every other, let's say this, if you want to be a professional Christian, people hold you to a different standard than everybody else. And so I actually just did this little Google search this morning. Did you know that in the NBA, the average free throw percentage is 78% made? In the, that means professionals standing on a line by themselves, no one guarding it, they only get it eight out of 10 times. But in the middle of a game, do you know the average free throw shot is only at 40%? You can be a professional basketball player and you only have to do it right four out of 10 times. In baseball, you only have to do it three out of 10 times and you're considered a good hitter. In hockey, 15% of the times if you score on your shots, you are considered a prolific goal scorer. But yet as a Christian... If we fly off the handle one time, you're allowed to question our faith? I'm going to go on record. If I get it right 15% of the time, I'm a prolific Christian. If not, you can bring my wife back up here of 18 years, and she has 432 stories to tell you. And I might have added one this morning, although I didn't. I bought her a gift this year. I bought her perfume. Yeah. She, we were, who cares? Okay, back to the sermon. Like, So here's where I'm going to maybe step on my soapbox just a little bit. And if I offend anyone, that would never be the goal. I'm just trying to help you if you ever come under an attack like this. So I think the people that would attack you, it does it for one of two reasons. Number one is because they are a very weak individual that when you're showing your strength, the only way they feel big is to make you small. And and again, that could be a very harsh statement, never be my goal, but in order for them to actually deal with them, they actually just have to destroy you. Or, and I do believe this more times than not, I think they're trying to invalidate the God that's trying to validate that they're lost. And to be able to point at you and say a thought like this, here's what our prayer should be. God, may you continue to do their work even through my foolishness. Because something powerful happens when we're okay when the nation hears of our praise, even if cutting off the robe wasn't what we were called to do. It's not about perfection. It's about praise. So here's what I'd love to do. I'm going to ask Cammy and Katie to come up here with me now. What we've been doing during this conversation, go ahead. You guys love them more. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. So one of the things we've been doing during this conversation is uh, having time just to have different people give feedback and thoughts uh, to what we've been sharing and talking about. Oh, thanks. (laughs) My wife is going to sit from the farthest seat from me. Yep, easy, 80 sandwich. Oh, great. So. Great. Here's the thing. Uh. The whole point of this is be conversational. You know that I sent you a question ahead of time, kind of the direction I'm going. But let me just throw this out there. Of what I just communicated, of what I just said, what did you hear? What did you want to add to? Is there any additional thoughts that you might have had? Um, For me, um, it stuck out to me the part about being continual in your prayers, being continual um, and not just saying, Jesus, help me and leaving it there. Um, Because that has a lot to do with what I was going to say, and I didn't know what you were going to say. So that's kind of confirmation of of being continual in your prayer every single day. That was good. Okay. So what was it that you were going to say then, if it kind of leads into that? What were you thinking? Oh, okay. Um, You mean like for the question you asked us? Okay. Yep, just go into it. So he asked us, um, how do we let God fight our battles? And so... um, For me, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, giving our heart to Jesus. And I think um, a way to, like, take a next step and to live a life of worship is to also give your mind to Jesus. 
And, um, and so something that I'm working on, something that's been really important to me is just giving my thoughts to God and giving, considering him and, and, um, just considering what he would think, considering him first before I do anything. And so, um, specifically when it comes to fighting battles, um, I think for me it is like essential when I let God fight my battles, I have to just let go of my gut reactions and I have to replace them with mindful responses and a way to do that is every moment of every day is That's letting good. go of those gut reactions. And for me, a gut reaction is like anger or resentment or self-pity or self-indulgence or just being inconsiderate towards people, wanting to gossip, just all throughout the day. Not even necessarily like conflict with other people, but in my heart and in my mind. And so letting go of those those gut reactions in the moment when you feel that, that, you know, that thing bubbling beneath the surface, boiling beneath the surface, just pausing, just stopping and saying Jesus out loud. You already yeah. said there's power in speaking things out loud. Just saying the name of Jesus and Holy Spirit speak to me in this moment. And Father, just send your, send your angels to protect me in this moment, to fight this battle for me. And, um, in Psalm 34, it even talks about how God's angels encamp around those who respect him and he delivers them through that angelic protection. And so that is huge for me in the midst of battles, whether they're practical, like I just had a fender bender and I don't know how to pay for my car or it's spiritual, like a relational breakdown with someone like a husband or a friend or a coworker being like, God, send me angels, <laughs> like yeah. fight this battle for me in the spiritual realm and, and help me to just pause in the moment. That is, it's huge for me. And just, um, the whole time you've been saying pause in the moment and I'm not a Seinfeld guy cause it's not a funny show. Um, oh, but I do know this. Incorrect. No. <laughs> That's right. It, it's, I'm right. Um, uh, he yells out all the time, serenity now. How many remember that episode? You know, the word serenity is to know when to take action and when not to, and knowing the difference between the two. And when you're pausing in that moment is to actually find that, if we can say it this way, the serenity found in Christ. When do I pause? When do I take action? I actually, if you don't mind, I'd love to throw it over to Cami because uh, I, I obviously got a little sneak peek of what you were thinking. So let me just, whatever you want to kind of cover right now, I'm sure your mind's So running. last night I was just thinking through some specific experiences in my own life of where I've been in a battle or in a difficult place in a hardship and places that um, I needed to go to God. And I was thinking though, everyone I thought of, I took a different posture. And so I was like, Oh, well, if I share that, but then I responded this way here, and I, I responded that way in this situation. And so it made me think of I, the, um, the, re the four responses that humans, nature, um, humans do, psychologists and scholars have said, is the um, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. I just recently le learned fawn, and that is basically people pleasing your way out of conflict. So I was thinking about those things. And so then I was, of course, then I was like, Lord, what was your original design there? Because, you know, if we get sick, like the intended design was that our body heal itself, you know, like, so, but we know because of um, the sin of Adam and Eve in the, in the garden that that comes and perverts things in, in, in our, in our world, in our life. And so I said, I was like, Lord, you know, what was maybe the original intended design? If that is just kind of a carte blanche at some point, a human nature response is going to be those things. And I actually thought those responses happen human to human, human to earthly situations that we get into. So I was like, and then immediately, immediately I felt like the Lord said, those were intended for us to go human to God, human, human to heavenly solutions, human to God. And so as I thought about those, I thought, so fight. Like, I know there's been times in my life that I feel like I'm fighting against the powers of darkness, the, the evil that would love for our families to be in turmoil, the, that would, the um, enemy that would love to trip up our kids so they don't go in the ways of the Lord. Mm -hmm. There's been those times, like, 
there's, I don't know about you, but there's like something that bows up inside of me, like this warrior that's going to fight against those, um, to that enemy. And like, I, I think of like, you know, Xena warrior princess, you know, maybe you think of, yeah. maybe you think of Braveheart, but you're coming against that, like, no, in, you know, um, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm more than a copter. And you're, you're proclaiming the name of Jesus and call me to get, and you're fighting because I mean the Bible does say we fight not against flesh and blood but of powers and principalities you're fighting against those principalities yeah. so in those times when we're connecting to God it's like no we're going to fight against that enemy and then I thought about flight I think in when we're coming up against temptation and sin and places that lead us to addiction places that that um, so easily beset us that that absolutely put shackles in our life flee those we're <laughs> Flee those. Like when we connect <laughs> with God, worship. flee them. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't even dance around with your temptation. If that's what, what um, keeps you trapped and keeps shackles on you and for freedom, flee. So I think God is like, flee those, run. So then freeze. There's absolutely been moments in my life, and I'm sure everyone can say, where you're just frozen. You know, you've even talked about like where you're on your knees and you're at the altar and it's God, I don't know what to do about this situation. I can't do anything about this situation. So I'm le laying it at your feet. I'm freezing in this moment with you. You go do your thing because yeah. <laughs> I can't do it. Um, and then the, the fawn, I feel like um, for that, when we go to connect to God, I think there are conflicts. There are battles that we do have to do things about. And if, if we're going about them to please someone else and another person and what they think, you know, that's, that's never going to be um, a, a service to us. But if we're going to go, God, in this situation that I'm in, this conflict, this battle, what would be pleasing to you? What would so be good. edifying to me? And what would be edifying to this other person that I'm in conflict with? And when we go about that, um, it, it's, it's very, very different. But we are called sometimes to, to have to figure out those conflicts. So if we're going to please him and see what's pleasing to him, it just changes things. So um, that's just kind of how I felt. And I thought that makes sense then of why there's different responses sometimes to different situations that we're in. Um, but they're all going to God to give him his worth and his worship to go, I'm going to get what your thoughts are. I'm going to, uh, because your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Your ways are higher than my ways. So, so I think we're all thinking the same thing. Why did I preach at all today? <laughs> okay, so in, in 30 seconds, I have a question for both of you that I didn't run through you first. So where is there a place in your life where you had to go, God, you got to fight this battle, I can't. Where is there a place in your life where you just had to say, listen, I'm stuck in this cave, but I'm going to trust the refuge. Where is there a place? And if you want to make it personal, great. Or... If you have a follow-up thought to what you just talked about, I don't want to put you on the spot. I know it's a brand new question. So as they think about that, how many here before, because right now, either what they have said is a one-off and it doesn't pertain to anybody else, or by a show of hands, who's been in here before that you had to turn to God to fight when it came for your worship? Okay. So, okay. This may not be weird. It's not one person. How many in worship before knew that you had to flee? Like, this was not what I need in my life. I got to run. Okay, good. It's not. So it can't just be a Cammie and Katie thing. It, like, this is, this is common to all of us. So, so how many would say this, that you've been in a situation before where you're just frozen? You didn't know what to do. And, you know, okay. So final question then. How many have been through a tough time, but because of that tough time, rather than turn your back on God, you fawned over him. You fell more in love with him because of that. Yeah. Okay, so, so either we're all happen to be a collection of weirdos that have experienced the same thing, okay, which may be yes and rather than either or, or this is something that, how God operates. So, and we're, we should be transitioning to worship right now, but I'm just loving what you, you guys are amazing. Um, where has there been a place in your life where you had to go, I, I got to give it to God, and this is, this is what it looked like. How did you find your praise? How did you... How did you discover him in the cave? So um, something that just kind of comes to mind is how there are certain family members of mine that are lost. And I took ownership of that for a long time where I'm like, they're not saved because I'm not sharing the gospel enough. I'm not being a good enough example for Jesus. And I held on to that and held it as like a point of pride or like as a point of like self 
loathing, I guess, okay. of like, they're not saved because of me, which is completely incorrect. <laughs> um, but I had to let go of that and just leave that for God. And I had to praise him of saying, they are your child. They're not my responsibility. I can keep praying continually, continually, all the time, every day. But I have to just trust the big picture and trust that the Lord has their story written. He has their, his timing. And it's not all on me. Yeah. It's not, that's a battle I held on to. And I had to just let that go for God and trust that he's going to handle that battle and that it's not even mine at all. It, it's not my battle at all. So. Nice. Absolutely. So let me tell you what I heard. In your time of worship, you discover that he's God and you're not. Yeah. <laughs> I discovered that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's the savior. You're not. Yeah. So God, I'll do everything I can do, but then we're going to leave everything else up to him. Well, that's awesome. Cammie, you have any thoughts here? I mean, yeah, just real talk. I think the the biggest battle for me that we went through is, is you finding your sobriety. Um, I think that was so many times I tried to put my own, t you know, hands to it, make my own plans, and even almost have this weird, strange faith that everything's going to be okay. But honestly, it was just my mechanism of glossy-eyed and, you know, rose-colored lenses. And it honestly was... When I finally, I was like, God, I cannot do this anymore. I, I can't, I'm not, I can't go to this well that I'm trying to produce of, of, um, of hope. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm hopeless. And honestly, it wasn't long after that God came in and, you know, gave us a, a plan, a yeah. plan of freedom and a plan. But it was also because I had to, I had to go to somebody else for help. Because I was trying to do it on my own. And in order to protect us and you and, and, and caring too much what, you know, Michael up in the window thought. <laughs> you saw, uh, talked about that last week. It was finally when I, you know, just had to go get accountability. And um, that's when everything changed. So you're saying it took one person to speak out and a nation change. So how about we do this? Let's speak out today. And maybe Collinsville will change. How about we speak out today and maybe the Metro East will change. Speak out today. Maybe Illinois can change. A nation could change. So I, I, can I do this? Can I invite the rest of the team to come up? Can you put their, your hands together and just honor these two amazing women?